This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, but we're really pleased anyway for, uh, to have Ben Lewis um, return. He's spoken here um, before, at least once, possibly more. I can't remember being in the store, and I was still nearly bad. <laughs> um, but we're very really pleased anyway to, uh, to have you just, you know, you're, I think, the co editor really of this. <laughs> volume, um, which um, I guess at least some people will know contains newly translated material, which um, I'm hopefully you're about to uh, explain to us what some of this uh, is about and, uh, and the significance of it and so on, and of course afterwards there'll be time for questions and discussion. So, Ben. About 40 minutes, you say? Yeah, yeah. 50 is fine. 40, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, again, thanks Keith for, for, for having me here. It is, I think it's my second time I came here um, in 2010. Uh, when I was working on a book uh, with Lars Lee um, on uh, Grigory Zinoviev and Yuli Martov. And at that time, I was approaching this talk today, I was actually in in the process of putting the book together uh, and it hadn't yet been published, but I came along and spoke to my research. Uh, And I'm wondering, is that a better position to be in or a worse position to be in? (laughs) Because this book came out last November and I think... I, the work kind of stopped on it about two years ago, so it's uh, for me also going back to, uh, uh, to, to some of the stuff I've been working on over the past couple of years. Um, yeah, this is a Revolutionary History volume. Uh, Stuart brought along a couple of copies if you haven't had a chance to get hold of it. Um, and it's also available online, etc. Um, Kara Zetkin and her importance then, and why we in Revolutionary History decided to uh, put this book together um, and some of the reasons why we think Zetkin is Im- important. Um, I want to start off with a, with a, a lovely quote from the, the Tour Congress of the French section of the International in 1920, uh, where they're obviously debating the question of whether that particular organisation should align with the, uh, the newly formed Comintern or, or carry on as, a, as a, an organisation of the Second International. And it reads as follows, from the, from the record, from the, the minutes. <coughs> Congress of Tours, Thursday, December 28th, 1920. Marcel Sembar presides. Since early afternoon, Elo Frossa, I, I don't, my French isn't the best, so he speaks. The lights dim, a shiver runs through the assembly. A few seconds later, when the lights go up, a woman with almost white hair stands at the platform. A woman whom the Congress, which rises as one, acclaims. It is Clara Zetkin, the delegate of the Third International. <coughs> saluted by the great the, by the session leader with these words this great noble and glorious woman who with the glorious friends Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg was the ardent and magnificent soul of the German revolution and apparently from the reports of, of, of that uh, uh, congress she she then proceeds to speak uh, um, for, for a, a short time uh, and essentially was there to swing the opinion of the delegates towards the Third International successfully. At that time, it was a bit of a, a, a semi-clandestine operation. Uh, they had to come smuggler in and smuggler out quickly, and it made the, the press internationally. I think it was a German woman sparks French reds or something. That was the title of one of the New York newspapers at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a, it was a, a, a key moment and a, and, a, and a fitting moment, I suppose, an, an illustrative moment of her importance as a, a political figure, quite clearly, for the for, for the, the, some of the French left at least, uh, she was up there with uh, Liebknecht and Luxembourg, the key figures of the German Revolution. Um, so what this book is, is trying to do, I suppose, is, as we say in the, in the editorial, to reclaim Zetkin as one of the heroic figures of the revolutionary socialist movement, as well as, as, well as to inspire renewed interest uh, in this admirable figure in a magnificent life. Because it's clearly the case today that, uh, as Keith alluded to earlier on um, in his opening remarks, the with International Women's Day uh, tomorrow, uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, um, events, certainly not on the, the question of Clara Zetkin and her importance to that uh, to, 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 to that uh, celebration, uh, which I'll go on to in a second. Um, so we tried in, a, in our own way, as part of a renewed interest in Zetkin, a very small, uh, limited interest in Zetkin in her life, to actually um, get across how important she was as a, as a political figure in, in, in the time and context. Um, so the, the four things I'd like to do um, in, in this uh, talk today, firstly to um, give a brief outline, necessarily brief outline of, of who Clara Zetkin was, because you know even for those of us who have been active in the socialist movement for a, a long time or um, study the, 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 the period, um, very little is actually known about her uh, in, in English uh, language literature, etc., and she's not that, that often discussed. I then want to look at why 
um, her work, her life has been has been uh, so marginalised uh, and, and neglected uh, um, since, since her death. Third, to then look at why her her, her ideas matter and why they're they're important and and, uh, and potentially helpful in, in in today's context, despite being written a, a long time ago. Um, and finally, to sketch out really how we've attempted to. Uh, highlight particular areas of her work that we see as important in revolutionary history and the particular material we've chosen uh, to get that across. I must stress from the start that this really is only the, the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of Sekin's work. She wrote a huge amount over the course of her life, journalism, translations, reviews, uh, uh, theatre criticism, art criticism, stuff on uh, um, teaching and how her uh, and pedagogy and how best to, to uh, uh, educate uh, the young and the, the those coming into the socialist movement, etc., etc. There's a vast array of writings, um, and really, as I say, we're just scratching uh, the surface. But hopefully, uh, this this work can inspire um, continued interest. So, firstly, who is Clara Zetkin? Um, well, she's she's got there are various labels attached to her her name and legacy. Uh, she was babushka communisma in the in the uh, in the Soviet Union, so the, the grandmother of communism, the, the communist grandmother. <laughs> I translate, I'm not quite sure. Um, J. P. Nettle in his his, his uh, book on Rosa Luxemburg uh, basically dismissed her within a few paragraphs. Pr paragraphs really is as somebody who's intellectually lesser figure than Rosa Luxemburg, uh, which I think is certainly questionable. Mm. Uh, certainly, what I'm going to say in the, in in in, in this, the talk here. Uh, somebody who has, uh, and this is this uh, uh, quote comes from uh, um, a book that John uh, co-edited with Marilyn Boxer, and then this is a quote from Marilyn who says that she preached division and sowed division in the women's movement. I don't want to uh, preempt John, but I, th I think we both agree that's not how we see it, see it because we've spoken on this before. Uh, so somebody who, is, who basically sowed division within the women's movement and by implication weakened it essentially. Um, in the German site in the 1990s, uh, called her, her, her a museum figure of no interest today. Um, but the favourite one, I think probably the most accurate one, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a strange way, uh, comes from the, the eminently quotable Kaiser Wilhelm II, <laughs> <laughs> who, uh, who, called, who called her, and I quote, the most dangerous witch in the German Empire. <laughs> and, uh, 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 you know, despite the ide ideologically loaded terminology, I think that of all of them, that's perhaps <laughs> the, the most accurate <laughs> description. Uh, so, you know, uh, good on Kaiser Bill. Um, but anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> so she certainly was a danger in the, to, to his particular uh, political edifice. Um, okay, so the, some, of, some of her achievements, some of the things she did. Uh, she was born in 1857, uh, relatively prosperous uh, background, um, very well educated, spoke French from an early age. Um, and essentially then, <laughs> like many... Um, educated uh, 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 class traitors, I suppose you could call them of the time, uh, is in, comes into contact with the socialist movement and its ideas. And uh, there's a famous letter she writes to her mother where she says, you know, uh, I can't act against my convictions. And with that letter, in a sense, the, uh, her, the, the following, uh, uh, her, her life is sketched out. She has to break with her, with her family to, to all intents and purposes. Uh, she uh, marries a, a Russian exile who's a, a, a socialist uh, and, and a no-gooder from the perspective of, of her, her own family. Um, so she breaks with that. Then uh, under the, uh, the anti-socialist laws from 1878 to 1890, um, she's forced into exile. <coughs> in France, as I spoke from French, works as a, a translator and journalist with her, with her husband, Ossip Zetkin, who uh, dies very young, uh, unfortunately. Um, and she starts to become active in, in, the, in the socialist movement, is friend with, friends uh, uh, with all the leading fingers of the time, very close with Karl Kautsky, who she lives up the road from in, in Stuttgart when she returns to Germany, uh, Babel, etc. Um, and she becomes in increasingly active, and I suppose the, the, the founding, um, her founding or most important political act is her speech in uh, 1889 at the founding uh, a Congress of the Second, in what later became known as the Second International, the founding Congress, the Marxist one, because obviously there were two competing <laughs> events on the, the same the same day. But she addresses the the, the Congress there on the question of uh, women's work, 
and there's a long history to this, but uh, some of the, the ideas in the, in the German movement at the time, certainly the Salian influence ideas, were essentially uh, based on the idea that women, having women enter the workforce, um, immediately led to the, the depreciation of the male wage, as it were. Um, and therefore was a, a generally a bad thing. Um, and she uh, gives a rousing speech at the founding Congress of the Second International to reject that idea um, and uh, to argue that uh, it would be a trope of her, of her, uh, her life, uh, of her later years, that um, it, men and women must unite against the, the force of capital. So if uh, women have the right to work, that not only gives them more independence and freedom, um, but also they potentially become, become play a very important role in, in the class struggle and uh, need to be organised on that basis. That was a, a very important speech, and as a result, well, maybe not as a result of that, but the, the, certainly the, the the rising tide of that idea. Um, for example, in the eighteen ninety one Alpha Program of German Social Democracy, uh, the the right of women, so that they, they, they describe and they banner the uh, women suffrage as well for the first time, which wasn't there in eighteen seventy five in the early program, the, the Gotha Program. Um, she then, uh, so subsequently when returning to Germany, she lives in Stuttgart um, and after the, the, uh, the lifting or the repeal of the, the anti-socialist laws in 1890, uh, the, the German uh, uh, SPD really starts to grow very quickly um, using the networks that it formed in, in, uh, in, under illegality. Um, the, the foundation of uh, the period Die Neue Zeit, but also uh, Die Gleichheit, which she, uh, within a couple of years, came to be the editor of. Uh, Gleichheit means equality, um, and it was the, uh, as it says in the, the subhead of the paper, the uh, newspaper for the interests of female workers, is how, uh, uh, is how the, the subtitle is. She, she comes to edit that to give it a particular uh, political direction. She's very much under the, the influence of the, the, the Marxist wing of the, mm -hmm. of the, uh, um, the international movement, so I say Babel. Kautsky are very uh, close friends of hers, uh, also Luxembourg as well, um, obviously we'll come to later on. Um, and using this, uh, um, th this newspaper, uh, she gets across uh, some, of her, some of her ideas, um, which, as I say, are on a wide range of, of, of topics. Um, one of the, the achievements of the, the newspaper as part of the international's work is then to form the, the Socialist Women's International, um, in which, again, she plays a, a leading role organising the activities of, of women, uh, certainly across Europe and to a certain extent beyond, but mainly within, uh, uh, within Europe and, and also to a certain extent the, the USA. Uh, the USA is important because uh, a, str a strike by women, I think in 1908, um, becomes the, uh, the, the, or sows the idea of an, uh, a special day dedicated to the interests of, of, uh, of, of women, uh, particularly the idea of, of, of female suffrage. So in 1910, the Socialist Women's International um, convenes just before the Copenhagen Congress of the Second International, 1910, and uh, Louisa Zietz and Tsekin um, put their names to a, a motion that, that takes this idea of a day dedicated to uh, the interests of women. Uh, across the world, and thus uh, give rise to the uh, International Women's Day, which I think only in 1914 becomes March the 8th. But there's a there's a, there's a kind of a difficult history behind that. But it's, it's certainly remember now it's March March the 8th uh, every year. I'll come back to speak about that in a second because I think it's it's illustrative of of also the way in which uh, Zetkin's ideas have been received across the across the century. The fate of the International Women's Day, as it were. Um, as part of her, uh, as her, uh, uh, as part of her role in the the international socialist women's international, despite the advice of the leading uh, uh, people in in the second international at the time, she actually continues. She argues that that group needs to carry on meeting and organise across the First World War. So when actually the, uh, the August the 4th, uh, 1914, the, the, the infamous uh, war credits vote in the German Reichstag on the part of the SPD, as a result of that, the Second International's many different political bodies essentially uh, agree to a truce, I suppose, <laughs> and to say that we're not going to meet during the war. This is uh, it's not within our, our, uh, our remit at the moment to continue meeting. But Zetkin uh, defies that, and a lot of political pressure comes on her. Um, but she argues that the, uh, uh, the, the women's group and also the uses of influence in the youth uh, movements to convene uh, international congresses during, uh, during the war at Bear and Stockholm, etc. Um, and, and she plays a very important role in that. And one of the uh, the key themes in her 
uh, throughout her life is uh, anti-imperialism and, and, and an understanding of, uh, <coughs> of, of, of capitalism's drive towards war. Um, she then becomes a, uh, a leading member of the um, the KPD, or was not a founding member, and this is one of the interesting things about Clara Zetkin, I would argue, is that um, her her understanding, her, her knowledge uh, of, of, of Marxism and her um, ability to assess political situations, uh, you know, very rapidly moving political situations, actually means that she makes, I think, some judgments. Um, she's, a, she's able to assess the time well and make sound tactical judgments. So one, of, one example I would use um, is that uh, on the question of the foundation of the German Communist Party, 1918-1919, uh, she is quite clearly a, uh, a partisan of uh, those kind of politics and it also sees the need for a break with the independent social democracy, which is equivalent on many different political questions. Uh, and she's obviously sympathetic to Liebknecht, Luxembourg, etc., who found this organisation. But she actually refuses to join at the time because for her, um, there was not enough, uh, they, they simply did not have enough support within the independent social democracy to really launch something substantial at the time. So she uses her influence, and this is in constant uh, uh, um, correspondence with Ibnesh and Luxembourg over this, and they're fine with it. But she says, it's just too early. We need to actually continue our, uh, our work in the, in the independent social democracy and win more people over. So she comes out, I think, in April 1919. Um, with the whole Stuttgart <laughs> branch behind her, basically, so lots of people join in, in one and that boosts the numbers of the KPD. So li little things you see flashes in her life, I think, show her ability to read uh, situations very well. And she always insists, again, a common trope for her ideas is that um, we we must not jump ahead of the masses. We must be in constant contact with the masses, learn from them, and etc. That's a very interesting uh, uh, point in her, in her career. Um, and she then becomes a, a key figure in the Communist International, um, as, as I alluded to in the, in the quote at the start, uh, close in particular with Lenin and Krupskaya, and lives through um, the ups and indeed many downs of the international communist movement uh, um, during the 1920s and uh, early 30s. Um, and again, we've tried to highlight some of that in our, in our, in our, in our little volume. Um, and I suppose her, her career um, culminates with her uh, speech against uh, fascism in 1932, uh, where this is this. I don't think it's a tradition that exists anymore in Germany. Um, maybe it reflects a time when age and wisdom were more revered. Uh, but there's a tradition in the Reichstag uh, whereby uh, there's, there's someone called the the age president or the president of age. So the the oldest member of the Reichstag would, would convene. Uh, that would give a speech to convene the first meeting of the, of the newly formed Reichstag. And she, in 1932, in a house packed full of uh, fascists, <laughs> um, essentially gets a wonderful speech that we've, we've translated here. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's kind of a harrowing tale because she's incredibly ill. She's had to be brought over from her, her dacha in, in, in Russia, um, where she's basically dying. Um, but she's, she's been elected and so they, they get her across she's facing death threats left, right and centre and all, all this kind of stuff. But nonetheless she stands up and uh, I'll, I'll give you a quote from the speech later on but it's an incredibly uh, moving uh, moment in her, in her career I think where she stands up in front of <laughs> various uh, fascist leaders and says you know the working class must unite to defeat the menace of fascism that stands before us and it's, a, it's a, I suppose a fitting way for to, to End of career. That was really her last public uh, political um, act um, before, she, before she died. Um, so, given all this and, and much more, I mean, I gave a very brief sketch of her career and some of the things she achieved and, and the, the, the things she's left behind. Given all this, why is it not the case that more of us are reading her, discussing her? Mm -hmm. uh, um, just, well, how, how does this come to pass? And I think. The, the March 8th thing, uh, the, 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 the phenomenon of March the 8th and, it, and its particular evolution um, does shed light on Zekin herself. Um, so if you think of, uh, of March the 8th, again, I haven't looked at the, the press in terms of how it's been spun today, but recent uh, uh, March the 8th, it's very much now a UN thing. So the UN every year has a, a theme, you know, women and progress, women and development, or the, and uh, that it's, 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 uh, that's what it's become. But it started off with radical socialist origins about women not only organising to achieve the right to vote, which again <coughs> seems 
it might, might not seem that radical from, our, from our, today's perspective, but you know, it's clearly, you know, think of the importance of the Chartists and the, the struggle for the right to vote, and then the, uh, women as well. It was an incredibly radical movement. Um, and and what it's uh, what it's become today. And a friend of mine in Germany always jokes that uh, you know what whatever uh, the socialist movement achieves, she she can swim for free on a on the in a March the eighth. That's the, the, the that's the achievement of uh, this, you know, this is what it's become. It's it's the idea, and it's very much prominent in in all sorts of uh, uh, modern discourse as well. That somehow capitalism itself brings in its wake. Uh, democracy, women's liberation, the right to vote, etc., and actually, so it's 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 almost an, a, a, an appropriation of the original ideas and a, and, a, and, a, and a misinterpretation of them, um, in order to put, put across a particular agenda. And again, we'll when you open your newspapers tomorrow, we'll see all the the quotes from Clinton or whatever. I'm sure, and, and you know, how these things uh, live on, how they're commemorated. But I think that's in in a way. So it's it's. Not only the fact that you know she dies and then the uh, German fascism comes to power, um, but also the general uh, fate of socialist ideas and socialist thinkers in the, in the in the twentieth uh, century. But beyond that as well, it can't simply be explained on that level. The marginalisation of socialist discourse, also her particular reception in uh, in the twentieth century by the various uh, uh, states on both sides of the of the Cold War frontier, which I'll um, sketch out in, in, in a second. Um, I just thought it'd be a nice one for uh, this is the a Gleichheit report so again I see the magazine shared it's this is after the first May Day I think this is a Berlin report and it says uh, maybe with slight hyperbole but nonetheless interesting in the neighbourhood of the assembly points many police squads equipped with revolvers protected the town from being overthrown by the women and then you, know, you fast forward 100 and whatever years <laughs> to today and uh, that, there we go there we have it um, but nonetheless so so it, it can't simply be explained on that level. It's also to, the, to do with the, the, the way in which her ideas were received uh, subsequently. And I'd like to just talk about that uh, briefly and, and how that has impacted upon her, her marginalisation uh, today. Um, in, in Western Germany, after uh, the Second World War, um, uh, some, an event like March the 8th, uh, International Women's Day was was seen basically as you know, a day of the devil, and it was uh, I mean, all about the, the radical social democratic uh, past. So it was a, something the establishment uh, were horrified by and, uh, and looked look down upon. But on the other hand, given what was happening with the SPD after 1945 uh, and the gradual distancing uh, of that party from its radical past, it was also a um, an embarrassment, if you like, for the SPD to uh, someone mentioned this day and its radical roots and in uh, its role. It was an embarrassment to a party that was in a in in a real process of of, of change uh, and and certainly coming on with the post forty five or post forty nine, uh, um, maybe more accurately, uh, political con consensus. Okay, only in nineteen fifty nine with the, the Bad Gordesberg conference of the SPD do they formally then say we have nothing to do with Marxism anymore. But this was uh, um, uh, something that was already happening uh, after forty-five. So the the, uh, the radical origins of, of, of March the eighth start to be downplayed, not just from the establishment, but also from the organisations that, in a way, gave gave birth to that uh, uh, to that day. Um, there were there were various uh, uh, communist groups in West Germany that, uh, that had a, an interest in Setkin and some of the things she said. Again, in the kind of stifling climate of. You know, the post forty five, the fifties, etc., on the, the, the position of women, society, the family, etc. Again, which Stekin has a lot to write about. Uh, but they were very small and so uh, and marginal. So they, they were they did do some little pamphlets on some of the things Stekin said, but nothing uh, that really uh, uh, caught on. Also. Um, important to Zetkin's marginalisation, not just in Western Germany, but in, in the West more generally, is her rather um, troubled, I suppose, relationship with the ideas of feminism. Um, and there's a, there's a nice summary of this by uh, Gazela Notz, who recently edited a book um, called Clara Zetkin in the Other Side uh, from 2008, and we, we published a few essays from that book and uh, translated them here. And she describes the relationship as, 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 fo as follows, I think quite accurately. Uh, Zetkin, she says, was for a clean break, quote, from the bourgeois women's movements, which she characterized as the upper 10,000 accused of, uh, and accused of feminism, Frauenrecht Lerei in German. So uh, anything with uh, I on the end of it in German is uh, um, 
is, is, is a way of denunciation or is something to 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 denounce somebody. So let's look at that. Um, she was neither a feminist, so it's not, nor a left feminist. The latter were unknown in her time. For her, feminists were bourgeois. So again, this idea of clever in in the other side in her time. Uh, locating the particular words she used and and, and, and and how she used them. And it was this uh, um, emphasis of Gazetkin's, I suppose, of the clean break, the idea that women's liberation uh, must be uh, something that is part of the workers' movement and vice versa, uh, that uh, led to her marginalisation in, uh, say, for example, the 70s discourse in, 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 the, in Western feminism, etc. Um, and this idea of, uh, you know, uh, class fundamentalism or something, these, 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 these uh, criticisms. And so that, that, that also, I think, contributed to, so while some radical feminist groups did have a certain interest in their ideas, again, it was very much on the margins of, the, of, 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 of those, those movements. Um, <coughs> so she, again, she rejects the notion of, a, of, of universal sisterhood, and, and I'll, I'll read some quotes about that in a, in a second. And she talks of uh, um, the... <laughs> Uh, the bourgeois feminists of the time arguing for the Dharman Bailesh, so it's the, the the right to vote for the ladies, you know, for the not not the great unwashed. And one of the lovely pieces of journalism we have in this uh, volume is basically a, a strike. She, she's describing a strike by the servant girls, who are incredibly uh, oppressed layers of the, of the of the of the workers' movement more broadly in Germany. And there's a strike, and she reports on it and saying how. The, the official women's movement at the time want nothing to do with these, but these are precisely the people that we need to organise in social democracy and get them on board. It's, it's, it's wonderful journalism, very, very sharp, incisive, sarcastic at times, and, uh, uh, and very, very good read. Um, so yeah, she had all, all of these views. There's a, a slightly longer passage um, here where she's particularly, this is from 1928, uh, and uh, you know, as if it, her v views weren't clear enough, this is this is her argument. The counter-revolutionary power, she says, of organised feminism is not a result of the alignment of the ladies and the bourgeoisie, but of its disappointing, paralysing influence on the great masses of working women, whose will and activity is concentrated on the struggle between the two sexes in order to reform society instead of the revolutionary struggle between classes. That's uh, obviously uh, shaped the way in which she was read uh, uh, subsequently in the, in the West. A very interesting um, later development as well occurred um, over the, uh, the naming of a, a street near the, uh, the Bundestag, now Bundestag uh, in Berlin. Um, and it, it, it sparked a little bit of controversy because apparently she was, she was recommended for her role as a Reichstag uh, um, MP. Uh, it was recommended that her name was on the, was, the street was named uh, after her uh, near the Reichstag, and there was a, a big debate in Germany in, uh, over this. Thing. Eventually, uh, after the intervention of Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of the time, um, it, the, the, the street was named after Dorothea von Brandenburg, uh, Princess Dorothea von Brandenburg, 17th century, maybe 18th century <laughs> princess, and it becomes even more ridiculous because. The, the reason given for uh, the rejection of, uh, uh, of Zetkin was that she contributed, apparently, to the downfall of Weimar democracy, so the standard liberal interpretation of, you know, the claps of the centre and the left and right are kind of the same and they were brought it down together. Um, but then you think, you know, what were the von Brandenburgs doing in there? Maybe there were the flawless, <laughs> flawless, uh, flawless Democrats. I, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that, that was a nice little spat again. Which, which so there, there was this uh, at least some interest. Say, Clarkus Edkin's name deserves to be here. And again, you know, you, you go through very even very bourgeois districts in Germany, even in, in Munich, and you do see Karl Liebnerstraße, also Luxemburgstraße, um, but Zetkin uh, really isn't part of that as, as, as much. I'm sure there are Clara Zetkin Straßen, but you know, in the, near the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Bundestag, um, that was, that was an, a kind of nice summary, I suppose, of where things are uh, in terms of the reception of her ideas. Uh, and Helmut Kohl is Helmut Kohl, um, so what do you expect? Um, <laughs> you know. Um, on the on the other side of of, of the Cold War frontier uh, in, in East Germany, there's a there's a a very different uh, uh, process of reception. So, what becomes of, of Tsekin in in, uh, in in East Germany is essentially she is lionized, she is deified, she is on all the the postage stamps, mugs, 
posters of you know faces, serious communist faces is, is everywhere, <laughs> and um, you know she does have a very serious. You know, she, you can tell she's an incredibly serious politician. I mean, it's uh, <coughs> lovely photos of her, but yeah, so that that's pretty much everywhere. Um, but of course, the, the 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 other side of this deification is the kind of sanitization of her her work and her memory mm. and some of the things she stood for. And again, very much the beginnings of this uh, work. We're trying to in this volume, we've tried to highlight various criticisms she had, not just of uh, of the Soviet Union, but in particular the way in which the Soviet Union led to the. Um, utter confusion and ultimate failure of the German Communist Party. So the way in which it would be involved in factional struggles and undermine certain people, promote others. She talks about how Ernst Thälmann's probably never read a chapter of any Marx and knows nothing, but he's being put forward as this, you know, the German Stalin, basically. That was, you know, and, and so you see in some of the letters we translated, you, you, you get a nice insight into these various factional uh, machinations and, and the role of the, of, of the Soviet Union in that. Um, so that's obviously glossed over uh, in, in terms of her reception. She's just this great heroic figure uh, and, and anything the critical she had to say about the, the Soviet experiment, if you like, or by implication in the GDR experiment, um, is glossed over. What, there's, a, there's a quote, I think, in here, um, which I suppose shows also the roles of gender stereotypes in, in a way. It's, it's Zekin's way of making a joke. She described Stalin as a neurotic woman in man's trousers, which, from, <laughs> which, from today's perspective, is quite you know, it's quite clearly uh, you know, uh, problematic. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it shows her ability to uh, play on or <laughs> manipulate. I don't know certain gender stereotypes, but that's, that's one of the ways uh, in which she describes Stalin in, in her uh, letters. I'll talk about uh, uh, Stalinism in, in uh, a little bit more detail uh, uh, soon. Um, but that was uh, so. So the, the, that was all glossed over, particularly her letters. And what happened uh, in obviously in the last ten, fifteen years that there's much more access to some of the archival material. So that the Ber the Berlin archive would have sat on a lot of this stuff for a long time. And I'm not quite sure who, you know how you get hold of it, whether you could then publish it. Uh, but certainly there's been since uh, ninety one a bit more interest in her work and uh, say all of her letters. There is this volume we took uh, of her letters come out in German very should be soon. Yeah. Um, and again, it's that's a big, a big collection of letters because she, you know, like most communists at the time, wrote a lot of letters back and forth across mm -hmm. <laughs> various places, not, not emails. Um, but so yeah, that was the uh, so so that's the, what we try to do with this book is is again point in in those directions. She's obviously been criticised uh, um, by by various people for not having spoken out publicly against the Stalin experiment. Um, and what I think we've tried to, to do is to emphasise actually her opposition to much of what was going on um, and, and her, her discontent and dissatisfaction with, with uh, some of the decisions being made. But nonetheless, at the same time, her optimism in a sense that things can still change and things can still be re reformed. Um, uh, so we tried to get across that angle. Um, what's interesting about her reception in the Soviet Union is that essentially, um, while she, you know, she's been ordained with all these wonderful medals and, and titles, uh, the, 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 the one, the Red Banner Order, the Lenin Order, all of these different uh, uh, great prizes. Given the uh, the turn in the late twenties, early thirties of the Soviet Union towards social policy, uh, the family, women, abortion, uh, homosexuality. Um, Basically, she's remembered for anything but her women's work in the Soviet Union. So there's again this this uh, deification, but not really talking about the the Socialist Women's International, etc. So it does show, I suppose, that even the you know the winner of the Lenin Order doesn't stand above the the ideological changes and developments within within the Soviet Union. But that, so it, it's interesting in that regard because in a sense it's the precisely the opposite. Uh, reception of what we would have in the West, in the sense, that, you know, Clara Zetkin, to the extent she would be remembered at all, is for you know so-called women's work, work amongst women, uh, the women's question, etc. Um, and that, that's certainly not the case in the Soviet. Union. How am I looking for time? Uh, so About good. ten minutes or so. Five, uh, five? Uh, ten, fifteen minutes. Okay, oh, yeah, well. no, I think ten should be. Fine. <coughs> um, so, and again, what we try to do, whether it's successful or not, I'm not sure, but we try to in this volume emphasize um, some of her political, more broad political writings, politi writings on uh, political economy, on the nature of war, on the nature of fascism, um, 
towards to get across that, that there was much more to Clara the Second than this aspect of her work, as important as it wasn't as central as it was to her. She also wrote on a, on a variety of topics. Um, so I suppose this is an attempt really to get beyond the fog of this 20th century reception uh, uh, of, of Zekin's work, not really to um, provide the definitive answers, uh, as it were, to uh, what she stood for and, 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 and the, the, the entire uh, um, political record as a whole, um, but at least to show that precisely because of this uh, distortion, uh, distorted reception, if you like, in the 20th century, certainly those of us who are interested in, in, in history and in, in socialism um, really do have to get our act together and get to grips with Clara Zetkin's uh, work, work much more. Um, as I say, this, this is very much the, uh, the beginnings of it. There are a, a number of volumes. I will mention uh, John's uh, co-edited pamphlet, which, which is also excellent, and it does go into a lot of detail on the reception of her, uh, her ideas. Um, you never have any with you, John. That's <laughs> but, uh, you can get it in Houseman's and also online. Very cheap. Two or three quid or something like that. Seven, seven pounds. Seven pounds, there we go. Oh. I thought it was cheaper, but it's, it's, it's very much worth the money, that's why. <laughs> but uh, again, I, I would also recommend uh, reading that in conjunction with, uh, with the, the book we've done, because it does get across the, the uh, Zetkin's importance. Um, why her ideas matter? I think I've already dealt with that on a, on a, in a number of ways. Um, while, as I say, there are there's, there's the occasional uh, uh, gender stereotype, which is rather irksome and stands out somewhat to seventy years on or whatever eighty years on. Um, I think she has profound things to say about the nature of uh, the, explo the exploitation of women under capitalism, the nature of war. Uh, um, her speech on, on the, the rise of the fascist movement, not as something that will maybe presage or lead to uh, the victory of the workers' revolution, but actually a mortal danger to the workers' movement. This is in, in, the, in the 20s with the rise of the, of the Italian fascists. Uh, is also um, very insightful and obviously contributed a lot to the, 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 the understanding of fascism as a new phenomenon um, of, of the time in, in the commenter. Um, and Many of the questions, of course, that she uh, she raises, the problems she highlights, uh, come 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 back to haunt us in a sense that these are these are political uh, uh, questions that need to be discussed and clarified in today's context as well. You know, what is the nature of women's liberation? What is the role of the workers' movement involved in this? What is the role of separate women's organisations versus collective, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, and is it possible to achieve women's liberation with, within the framework of, of capitalism? And this is one of the things she's, the theme she constantly uh, returns to. So, how have we finally? How have we tried to um, get across some of these points in, in the in, in the book? What, why have we chosen the material we've chosen? There was a, a lot to uh, to go through. Uh, we there's some things that we didn't include, which is a shame. We we the masses are already calling for volume two. It's only, been, it's only been out a couple of months, but I have it. And it's been suggested to me that we should do a second volume. It could certainly be possible. I'm very busy at the moment, but, uh, but this, this is more than enough material for another volume, maybe even two. Uh, and I, I think the, 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 just the enjoyment I've had in working on this stuff certainly uh, uh, I mean, it makes me tempted to return to it at some point in the future. Um, because we had to leave a lot of stuff out. So, for example, her experience in the Caucasus of relating... Uh, to uh, uh, to women um, with hijabs, living traditional uh, uh, peasant lives, and the role of you know what, what do we do there? What do we say? What's the role of communists in this? How do we challenge these these things? How do we relate to these women? How do we speak to them? Uh, so that that's a pamphlet she wrote in the twenties. Uh, it's called In the Liberated Caucasus, uh, and again fascinating stuff in her recollections of her work there. <coughs> Um, obviously of, of, of importance and indeed relevance. She wrote, um, how do you translate that? The, the History of the Proletarian Women's Movement, uh, in, uh, I read from that earlier on, published eventually in the 2028. That's a whole uh, book-length discussion of precisely the people involved, the organisations, the disputes they had, the, uh, the differences over political tactics, strategic questions, which are very, very interesting. We had to leave, leave that out. Uh, and so on and, and so on. She also wrote a, a very interesting book um, against her erstwhile uh, very close friend and comrade Paul Levy, um, basically who 
reprinted uh, Rosa Luxemburg's writings on the Russian Revolution in the early 20s after falling out uh, with the Comintern and with Lenin. And so it's basically, it's, it's a very difficult trans, uh, title to translate, but it's on Rosa Luxemburg's position on the Russian Revolution and basically against what she saw as Levi's distortions, both in, uh, also in his, he wrote a long introduction to it in the Russian Revolution. So uh, the Russian Revolution, as I say, despite her um, many criticisms of what's happened subsequently, was certainly of great importance to Zeki in her whole life until she died. Um, and that was quite clear, and she was trying to get that across in uh, uh, her discussion of, uh, of Luxembourg's works as well. So this is some of the stuff we had to leave out, unfortunately. There's, there's a lot more to come, um, as it were. But we've, as I say, we've, we've highlighted certain things that we think are, are interesting. One of my favourites is the uh, a critique of Bernstein in the revisionist controversy. Uh, and the two reasons why I thought that was, well, three, I think. Uh, firstly, because her argument is basically... Well, Kautsky's dealt with the theory, I'm just going to have a good kick in a Bernstein, and she proceeds to do it very well. <laughs> she said, if, you want the, if you want the theoretical discussion, read the United site. If you want me to just have a good go at him, here we go. And she does a great job. Very, again, very uh, she, she, wonderful use of language, uh, 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 irony, sarcasm, etc. Very, very, very uh, uh, strong polemic. Also, though, that um, she, for, for her, the, the, the role of a women's newspaper within a social democratic party was not simply to, uh, uh, to address so-called, and I hate this term, women's issues. It was actually to say, you know, that, that a debate that might seem kind of marginal to the, uh, you know, an interest for, uh, I'm sorry, a newspaper for the interests of proletarian women. She said, no, this is absolutely crucial. We want articles on these theoretical disputes that affect the party as a whole, that affect the class as a whole. And I thought that was interesting. It's not, it's not a greatest work, <laughs> I have to say. It's, uh, so she basically says, uh, Kautsky did all this, I'm just going to uh, get involved <laughs> and, and throw in my, uh, my, my uh, thoughts. But I thought it was interesting to highlight that as precisely the, some of the things she uh, saw were important to uh, a, a left-wing uh, socialist newspaper uh, for the interests of, of, of women. Um, Letters to Lenin, again, she had a very um, close relationship uh, with, with Lenin and Kripskaya. Um, there were about three or four letters, I think they're now available in their entirety, there are about three or four remain, remaining ones, and we've, we've translated uh, those. Uh, Gunter Wernicke's article, again from this Klager Zetkin in ihrer Zeit, volume I mentioned, uh, it's essentially very good overview of her opposition to the various things the Comintern was doing uh, to the German Communist Party and the promotion of certain people and the harassing or undermining of other, of other uh, comrades in the party. Uh, very interesting. Uh, a section on the, the, from the book I mentioned on the history of the proletarian work, uh, uh, women's movement, uh, which is essentially on, on the, 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 what she calls the bourgeois uh, women's movement, her stuff against fascism, her commenting thesis on uh, guidelines for the communist women's movement, etc., etc. There's a, there's, so despite having said there's a lot we had to miss out, there is a lot of material in there that I'm sure uh, comments will find interesting uh, uh, and, uh, and hopefully insightful. Um, I suppose if I was to sum up her life, it's, it's, she's uh, uh, typical of a generation of selfless revolutionaries who went through the, the bravery, the self-sacrifice, and ultimately the tragedy of that particular period from the, the growth, the, the, the almost an unstoppable growth of the workers' movement in Europe through to uh, the, the rise of, of the German fascists. And uh, just two quotes to, uh, to finish, uh, if I may, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is the tragedy, I suppose. This is a letter to Lenin uh, in, uh, in April 1919. Uh, she says, many thanks for your letter. I received it considerably belatedly, which is no wonder under these circumstances. There are reasons for my not replying earlier. The murder of Karl Liebner, and especially Rosa Luxemburg, was a terrible blow. It hit me with equal cruelty, cruelty as a militant as it did a human being. Almost immediately afterwards came the death of my friend Franz Mehring, and then soon after came the murder of Leo Jorgeshe. This came hardly 24 hours after I left Berlin, where I discussed the whole situation and our tasks with him and how we had planned some new work. Leo's death has taken from me the last of the small group in which we had been fighting together in a de facto order association and personal friendship for 15 years, especially since the 1st of August 1914. Of the four who first protested against the world war and fought for the revolution, I am the only one now alive, and in Germany I personally feel completely orphaned. For me, with Leo, they killed Rosa a second time. 
I could and can only elevate myself above all the terrible things that have happened through feverish work. How much I would like to come to you in Russia. As a young thing, I would find my first and true homeland amongst the Russian revolutionaries, says Osip, her husband. And for me, it would be the greatest joy to work and struggle amongst you. Yet I think it is my duty to hold out here. We are lacking in forces and the masses are flocking to us. Beaming with joy, Leo read me a letter from you and Trotsky and we discussed how we ought to work with you in the same direction. It was probably the last one he received from you. So that's the, 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 the assessment of the, the, the tragic events unfolding around her. But nonetheless, the flashes of optimism that we'll work through this and uh, you know, it's uh, incredibly harrowing. And I suppose I should finish really with the, an example of, of those, both of those things personified. Um, where, uh, again, you can listen to this on, on, online, uh, uh, obviously in German, but you can hear how frail she is. She can hardly speak. And this is in the German Reichstag in 32. And um, so to just two things she says so the, in, in the Reichstag. The, the millions of women who are still subject to the chains of gender slavery and thereby the harshest class slavery must not be absent from the united front of working people. There's also being formed in Germany, i.e. against the, the rights of fascism. And then she, she finishes, voice breaking, in fulfilling my duty as the oldest member, I am opening the Reichstag and I hope, despite my present illness, to have the happy experience of opening the first Council Congress of Soviet Germany as its oldest <laughs> member. <laughs> you know, was Goering present? <laughs> he was, he was, sure he, he was. He was. And, uh, so he was one of the people uh, organising the death threats. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, so yeah, in front of Goering and co, that's how she concludes her speech. And I think... Uh, you know, if, if there's nothing we can take from Zetkin, there's certainly uh, uh, that, that combination of hope and, and bravery and hard work, uh, which is uh, inspiring. I suppose. So, thank you very much. I hope you